Welcome to this evening's webinar, Innovation in Nuclear. My name is Tony Irwin, and I'm the Chair of Engineers Australia, Sydney Division Nuclear Engineering Panel. The Nuclear Engineering Panel was established in Sydney in 1975, so we're now 45 years ago, uh, to provide advice and information in the area of nuclear engineering and science, so the NEP is the focus within Engineers Australia for nuclear issues. So I would like to acknowledge country. Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. And we pay our respects to them and their cultures and to elders, both past and present and emerging. So this evening, I'm delighted to welcome the Honourable Taylor Martin, a member of the New South Wales Legislative Council and Chair of the New South Wales Nuclear Inquiry Committee. We're also joined by uh, the Honourable Dr David Gillespie, uh, the Federal Member for Lynn and Member of the Federal Nuclear Inquiry Committee. Uh, unfortunately, Parliament is sitting today and he won't be able to actively participate. But Hope he's be able to join us. And already I see that we've got many distinguished people joining us this, this evening on, online. Um, over 460 have registered for this uh, event. So please use the, the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen at any time to, to ask a question and we'll, we'll do the questions later. But I'll now hand over to Robert Pritchard, Executive Director of the Energy Policy Institute of Australia, to introduce the video that we'll be showing. Thank you, Tony. Um, I hope I can be heard by everyone. Uh, I want to um, take this opportunity on behalf of the Energy Policy Institute to uh, introduce uh, Mrs. Jarawoski. Um, and her presentation. Um, we've known uh, Mrs. Jarawoski for a couple of years. Uh, I first met her in Tokyo the year before last uh, at one of the international framework for cooperation on, uh, on nuclear energy events. Um, that was at a time where she'd been thrown, she was thrown in the deep end as a uh, representative of the United States on the uh, council of that organization, which was just a fledgling, fledgling organization at the time. Uh, since then, she's uh, made such a hit that she's uh, been elected as, as the chairman of the, uh, of the organization. And uh, I had the pleasure of meeting her again in Washington in November uh, when we had the uh, last year's annual meeting of the International Framework for Cooperation on Nuclear Energy, which is, uh, I might just explain very briefly um, what it is that's special about this IFNEC organisation that uh, Susie, as she likes to be called, um, is now chairing. What's special is, it's like, a lot of you will remember, when APEC was formed, it's like APEC, that is, it's a non-binding, voluntary organization which cannot make rules and and therefore uh, it depends for its efficacy on people genuinely collaborating with each other and so it doesn't cut across any of the other international organizations like the international atomic Ener energy agency it simply operates as a body to facilitate collaboration and cooperation on a non-binding basis between members. Australia is a member, I'm pleased to say. Um, Susie uh, um, took over the chair in Washington last year and just this month she's initiated a, uh, a, a really uh, great idea and that is, uh, like Engineers Australia, uh, IFNIC have now set up a series of, of webinars um, and I attended one last night where we had people from Washington and Paris and elsewhere in Europe, um, as well as Australia, participating in a really informative round of uh, panel discussions. 
Um, so Susie um, is, a, is a real mover and shaker in Washington. Um, she, he, she functions as a, uh, a go-between between between the White House and the State Department and the Department of Energy itself on behalf of the Office of Nuclear Energy, which is within the department, and and liaises, of course, with uh, people up on Capitol Hill. So she's right in the center of things in Washington and now internationally as well. Uh, the video that you're about to see um, was prepared by uh, Susie for uh, a visit to Australia at the time of the International uh, uh, Youth for Nuclear Congress earlier in the year. Um, she couldn't make it the last minute. She was sort of almost the last plane to be stopped leaving Washington uh, and she couldn't get here, but she ran this video off um, for us and we were absolutely thrilled at the way she um, uh, presented it. Now, what I want to advise you about in advance so that you don't get tired and, and turn off, this video is going to run for about 12 minutes. Just think about this as you're listening to it. What is it that the United States is doing that we're not doing? And I think, without letting the cat out of the bag, I think you'll be as impressed as I am with the way in which the United States is taking its scientific and engineering prowess and turning it to good account. The amount of activity that's going on in the United States uh, right now in terms of uh, uh, promoting uh, the, the scientific study and, and engineering study of um, energy systems and nuclear in particular is just nothing less of it than outstanding. So without more ado, I think we should show the video. Joanne, can you, um, can I pass it over to you to run the video, please? Hi, good evening. Greetings from the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Nuclear Energy. I want to thank the Energy Policy Institute of Australia for inviting me to send this message to you today. I'd like to talk about a couple of things with this opportunity of this wonderful audience uh, that, that's there this evening. First of all, thank you for coming. I know that Bob Pritchard has put a lot of work into this event, and I want to thank Bob personally for the invitation. There's a lot happening in the United States and around the world in pursuit of nuclear energy as an important part of clean energy systems, national security, and non-energy peaceful uses for nuclear technology. So I want to give just a highlight of some of the things that are happening in the United States and some of the ways that we are collaborating with other countries around the world. It's an exciting time in the United States for nuclear. Within the next five years, we'll be working to launch the first small modular reactor at the Idaho National Lab. It's part of the Carbon Free Power Project. It's an interesting project because there will be 12 modules of this small modular reactor. One module will be a joint use research module. The remaining 11 modules in the pack will be used to provide electricity to the Idaho National Lab, Idaho Falls and surrounding area, plus several states around the Idaho and Utah areas of the United States. It's the first SMR to be launched in the U.S. and we're very excited that it's part of the Carbon Free Power Project that the U.S. Department of Energy has been working on for several years now. Another big milestone that's happening this fall is the fueling of Vogel 3 and 4 the United States' first advanced reactor plant. It's an exciting time because as the fuel is loaded and tested in the fall, we are looking forward to those two reactors coming online next year in 2021 to start powering clean energy in the area of Georgia, USA. The United States Department of Energy was instrumental in supporting those two reactors through our loan programs office and providing loan guarantees to helping develop those two reactors. Some of the programs that we have in place to be active in bringing in new ideas, new designs through to fruition till final commercialization are two programs that engage industry with the National Lab system. The first is called GAIN 
The acronym stands for the Gateway for Accelerated Innovation in Nuclear. GAIN really focuses on those early stage ideas for new development, new innovation, and new technology. It brings large and small companies together to partner with national labs to bring the scientists and the resources of the labs together to help those ideas become a reality. Once those ideas are ready for demonstration and testing, they move to another program area that's at the Idaho National Lab. It's called the National Reactor Innovation Center, NRIC for short. At NRIC, they test and help de demonstrate these new technologies. Right now in the United States, there are over 20 advanced reactor companies that are going to be launching ideas and new demonstration designs in the coming years. Most of those new designs will need HALU, the high assay, low enriched fuel that's not right now commercially available in the United States. That's another program the U.S. Department of Energy is working on, is to be able to supply HALU to those new advanced reactor designs that have such great innovation that solve some of the challenges that we've had in nuclear, bringing the next generation of nuclear into the future. Additionally, the U.S. Department of Energy is right now in the early stages of developing a versatile test reactor. It's a, an advanced fast neutron reactor that will help us in creating the next generation of nuclear technology for the world. Another area that we're very proud of is more on the global stage in clean energy and collaborating with other countries. This initiative is called the NICE initiative. Not only is it a very pleasant acronym, it stands for Nuclear Innovation for Clean Energy Future. It was launched in 2018 at the Clean Energy Ministerial. The Clean Energy Ministerial is a really important platform because it's governments from all around the world coming together in the name of developing clean energy systems. It's really fantastic that starting in 2018, nuclear was warmly welcomed into the Clean Energy Ministerial as an important, robust fuel source for clean energy systems. Another initiative that's part of the Clean Energy Ministerial is called C3E. C3E stands for Clean Energy Education and Empowerment. The mission of C3E is to promote gender diversity in clean energy fields and to encourage equal pay and equal opportunity for women in clean energy fields. I'm proud to be able to work as a vice chair in the Clean Energy Ministerial's three C3E initiative. One of the areas we're focusing on is creating role models that create awareness for women in clean energy and they, they can have the opportunity to see if it's a pursuit that they'd like to explore for a career, if they're interested. We also are a repository for many different scholarship programs and then finally internship programs around the world so that women can have awareness of what kinds of fields clean energy can offer as a career then get the education and get the experience if those are fields that they're interested in pursuing. So I'm very honored to be a part of that program. There's an awards program in C3E, so take a look online if you're interested in nominating someone for one of those awards. It's a very worthy program. Finally, it's important to me to be able to talk to you in Australia right now about nuclear energy. I'm the chairman of the International Framework for Nuclear Energy Cooperation. It's another acronym, it's called IFNEC. And IFNEC is really important because it brings together the government leadership from 65 different countries. They're not all leaders of countries that are currently actively involved in nuclear energy, but they are all countries that are interested in what nuclear can bring and the peaceful uses of nuclear technology to our world. So even a country that may not currently be actively involved in nuclear, but are interested, are more than welcome to get involved in IFNEC. Some of the priorities of IFNEC right now are helping to pave the way for what we see coming down the line in the next three to five years in moving design technology into commercialization and operation of next generation nuclear. Small modular reactors are a big focus in IFNEC right now. We collaborate and share information with experts from around the world on what's happening in licensing, development, and safety, innovations, 
spent fuel, all having to do with small modular reactors and other advanced designs. Next, we look at the financing. What can we do to help further financing opportunities for these clean energy solutions that will be coming in the future? And then another area that I know you're familiar with is the concept of repositories. IFNEC is looking at places around the world that we could partner and help different countries explore if they're considering developing a multinational repository that can be an economic development opportunity for a country while also solving the challenge of what to do with spent fuel. So it's an important endeavor. I invite you to consider attending the IFNEC meeting that will be held in Kenya, Nairobi, November 9 through 11. So if you're interested in IFNEC, go to ifnec.org or contact my office and we'll be happy to get you information about IFNEC. Finally, there's an area that I've worked on since I've been with the U.S. Department of Energy, and that is communications and education. Because we don't really have a technology problem in nuclear. We don't really even have a waste problem in nuclear. We have a problem of what to do about dealing with our spent fuel. But a big challenge at the end of the day is the communication, the understanding, and the education about what nuclear really brings to our world. And so I've worked very closely with a very talented group of people at the Department of Energy. And we have five different areas that we work on education and outreach to tell the real story about what's happening in nuclear technology today. Our program for education falls into five areas. We have a K-12 education program that is being introduced in more than 50% of the school systems in the United States. We have an elementary school module we're working on, there's a middle school module that's been introduced, and a high school module that's being introduced. If you're interested in seeing those modules or helping to spread the word about the education that's available, it's right there online at navigatingnuclear.org. The U.S. Department of Energy works with the American Nuclear Society and the Discovery Education Network to bring you very high production value of interesting lessons that students can be engaged with on a digital platform, like having a virtual field trip to the Idaho National Lab. The next area we look at is on college campuses. College students have an important voice in the future of policy and in energy. And so we visit college campuses around the country and sometimes around the world and have what we call clean energy talks. We're inviting solar, wind, thermal, hydro, all to come together and talk about what each fuel source can bring to a clean energy system and have an authentic, honest conversation with these leaders of tomorrow on college campuses. The next area that we're working in, in terms of education and outreach, are policymakers. Every month, the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Nuclear Energy has what we call Atomic Wings Lunch and Learns on Capitol Hill. It's a fun and interesting way to bring education from experts up to Capitol Hill and have a conversation with lawmakers, their staffers, and other stakeholders about what nuclear technology and the peaceful uses can bring to our world so that the policymakers really have an opportunity to ask questions and start a dialogue with the U.S. Department of Energy based on the facts from experts. Finally, we have a very robust outreach program with the public. One area is in media relations where we're working hard on telling the story of what's happening in nuclear innovation from the 17 national science labs around the country and having that story told in more mainstream media with newspapers and other broadcast outlets to talk about why nuclear is important to our country and our world. And then we have a very robust social media program, and, and I invite you to go to energy.gov and visit the Office of Nuclear Energy's website to see some of our communications tools and invite you to share those tools in your community to help spread the word about the reality of how nuclear and the peaceful uses of that amazing technology can benefit our world. So please keep in touch with me. Please keep in touch with the U.S. Department of Energy. I hope that this is the first of a long dialogue that we'll have together in talking about what nuclear can bring to the world. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. So many great initiatives there from, from the U.S.
Great to see that SMRs are close to deployment and Vogel is, uh, is, is close to starting up as well. Um, now I'd like to introduce Taylor Martin, uh, Chair of the Standing Committee on Safe Development and of course uh, the Chair of the, the Nuclear I Inquiry. So over to you Taylor. Thank you Tony and thank you to yourself and Bob and Joanne for setting up um, this evening and making it possible uh, and especially to Engineers Australia. Well after decades of promises and subsidies for wind and solar uh, we still only generate here in New South Wales just over 7% of the electricity we need from those sources, from renewable sources. Uh, these sources just are never going to be able to power the kind of competitive industrial manufacturing economy that New South Wales deserves. So on several occasions in recent years, uh, New South Wales has actually been at, at risk of involuntary load shedding, uh, known colloquially as blackouts. In 2023, uh, of course, Liddell is slated to be switched off, and we've been warned by AEMO, the Australian Energy Market Operator, uh, that 770,000 households will be at risk of a blackout during an extreme heat event. Um, we risk these blackouts becoming more and more common as coal-fired power stations, of course, reach the end of their life, uh, and as our population grows further, and of course, demands more electricity and energy for more and more needs, particularly uh, as more people move to electric cars and whatnot. Um, so we're going to have a greater reliance uh, on energy into the future. On these occasions when our power supply is at risk, we're asked to turn off our air conditioning units um, and industrial sources are asked to turn down their power use. Uh, Tomago aluminium smelter in particular, the state's largest single consumer of electricity uh, and home to over 950 jobs alone in the Hunter region, is required to reduce its electricity consumption. The Tomago smelter is obliged to do this when instructed by AEMO, and each time that they reduce their power usage, they risk a catastrophic potline freeze that would take years and millions of dollars to repair, which has been seen uh, in Victoria in the past. But these are likely scenarios uh, that would happen uh, and we'd lose those 950 jobs from New South Wales and Australia. Uh, there is one option that has remained elusive in Australia, uh, and it should be given the consideration that it deserves to solve uh, this problem that I've just briefly outlined. Um, and that is uh, that there are well over 400 nuclear power plants operating around the world, including 97 alone in the USA. Many European countries are reliant on nuclear energy, uh, with 12 countries, including, of course, France, Sweden, Belgium, amongst other, that generate over 25%, in France's case, over 70%, of their electricity from nuclear power. Yet nuclear power has been banned in New South Wales alone since 1986 and federally since 1999. And the safety of the newer technology um, has advanced in leaps and bounds since those bans were enacted in Australia. And, and particularly with the next generation that are going to come online uh, and particularly with small modular reactors, as many of you will uh, surely know. Now, small modular reactors small modular reactors could very well be the silver bullet that we keep on searching for in the Australian um, energy policy debate. In these new designs, we'll have secure, uh, reliable, dispatchable, emissions-free uh, electricity, capable of filling the gap that will be left by the closure of all our coal-fired power stations. Now, in addition, of course, it's emissions-free and it'll greatly assist our state and our economy um, to get to the net zero emissions targets that, of course, are being much debated and, uh, and locked in around the world. Uh, we'd be able to do that without the kind of sacrifices that we'd see if we were to rely on solar, wind and hydro alone. And the outdated arguments for the, for prohibition, for the prohibition of nuclear power on the basis of safety and environmental pollution uh, are simply becoming more and more difficult to defend year on year. Evidence presented at the recent parliamentary inquiry that I chaired show that nuclear power around the world uh, since the 1950s has resulted in enough emissions abatement to have saved over 1.8 million lives that would have been lost to respiratory diseases um, if those power stations were actually fossil fuel based uh, instead of uh, nuclear power. The ongoing technological advancements in the recycling, re uh, reprocessing 
and disposal of nuclear waste has meant that historical environmental concerns are simply overstated in this day and age. Now, we cannot afford to keep kicking this can down the road uh, and putting off what, in my, in my opinion, is inevitable. We must embrace these opportunities sooner rather than later that come from a nuclear future at the science, the technology jobs, the high paying mining jobs uh, and having a more diverse economy. It includes more than just service and recreation industries. And if we were to do that, future generations would thank us and wonder why we didn't do it sooner. Now, this is a view that I've come to having chaired the New South Wales inquiry. I believe uh, Dr. David Gillespie is also joining us um, possibly later um, if Parliament allows. Uh, he was a part of the federal inquiry, I believe. Um, both inquiries, which have been released over the past six months, um, very much came to the conclusion that Australia should be moving towards uh, accepting and being a part of this small modular reactor future. Um, so, Tony, thanks again, and, um, and Bob, uh, happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Taylor. Um, what immediate question for you? Um, Suzanne, in her video, uh, mentioned education and particularly community education, school education. Um, and this was one of the recommendations in, in your report. Um, how are we going to proceed with this sort of education? That's a, that's a great question because, as Suzanne mentioned, it is probably um, one of the key missing puzzle pieces. Uh, I know there are several, um, there are several uh, viewers here tonight, particularly Addy Patterson, uh, Mark Ho and Geordie Grates from, from ANSTO. I think um, it'd be great to be able to engage more between government and particularly the Department of Education to engage with ANSTO. Um, they have great programs on offer and to see the take up of, um, of, of more, more content to be circulated, particularly through our education system, but also through the community. And I think um, politicians and some media commentators uh, probably have quite a role to play here as well in getting some of the facts out there. Um, it has to be said, uh, those who are against nuclear power, those um, who are against uranium mining, uh, can be very vocal and very loud and have uh, quite a network of activists and commentators ready to come out uh, at any point in time and tell us uh, that we, it's not needed, uh, that it's, it's, um, it's dangerous um, and that wind farms and solar panels will save the day. Um, well, as I said at the introduction of, um, uh, of my segment tonight, after a tripling of solar and wind here in New South Wales in the last seven years or so, um, we've still only got 7% of our energy needs coming from those sources. Uh, it's very hard to see how we're going to be able to ramp that up um, when it's needed as our coal-fired power stations are coming offline. Uh, so to get back to your question, Suzanne's right, uh, communication and education is key. That's what has happened for a very long time, particularly in some of those Northern European countries. Um, I think it's very interesting to see what's happening, particularly with New Scale in the United States. I think there are going to be more instances of larger, more reputable co companies like GE and Rolls-Royce coming online, engaging in the design process and ultimately bringing um, to commercialization a small modular reactor. It's getting, it's getting more out there in the, um, in the everyday media and I think it, it's only going to go forward. Uh, Taylor, we've, we've got an associated question coming on this. Uh, how can publicly funded media outlets and educational systems at all levels be forced to promote facts without bias? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting question. Um, look, that is a great question. Um, it is a tough one in, in the Australian um, landscape, particularly you mentioned publicly funded media outlets and, um, and the education department. Uh, they do make independent decisions. So I don't think that any of my colleagues can particularly make them do or say anything that they don't really want to. Um, it's part of the wider debate. There are enough media sources and commentators that this is starting to get inserted into the energy discussion. Um, so look, I, I look forward to the, the debate. The facts are on our side. 
um, particularly here in the New South Wales Upper House, after handing down to the report. Uh, it was interesting to see the Greens give a four to five minute lecture on why nuclear power economically wouldn't be viable in their opinion. It was very interesting to see that the left of the political spectrum are now actually trying to defeat nuclear power, not on the grounds that it's dangerous or uh, that, it's, that it pollutes the environment, um, but that it simply doesn't stack up uh, dollar wise. Well, um, that's that's definitely a battleground that I think many who are armed with the facts are happy to, to, um, to take the other side of that argument. Here's uh, one for you, Bob. Um, why was uh, nuclear prohibited in uh, 1999 in, in Australia? Um, yes. It was prohibited, Tony, as a result of an expedient uh, resolution of a dispute in the federal parliament uh, principally. Uh, although it was repeated in some of the states, that uh, on environmental grounds, nuclear shouldn't be considered because of its association with nuclear weapons and uh, and any other concerns about safety that uh, people may have held at the time. But it was never necessary to ban it. All you needed to do was to regulate it. I mean, why ban an activity um, when in fact you've got perfectly sound regulatory systems. We've got in Australia a, a regulator already in the form of our Panzer, um, which is fully equipped and, and, and fully staffed to be able to deal with these uh, uh, issues of concern. The, uh, uh, the reality is that they would have to, if, if the ban was lifted, the that the regulators would have to put on more staff to cope with the clearly additional workload involved. But you remember all those yellow signs that appeared around uh, the major cities and some of the country towns about 30 years ago? This is a nuclear free zone. Um, it, it, it was actually a misleading statement because uh, uh, it should have said this is a nuclear weapons free zone. Everyone agrees that nuclear weapons uh, are not uh, uh, to anyone's uh, liking. Um, we shouldn't have them in Australia, they shouldn't have them anywhere in the world. Um, but peaceful nuclear um, uh, uh, generation uh, or electricity generation using nuclear power um, is, is perfectly safe. It's been safer than uh, even solar power um, the reason they have accidents with solar power is that people keep on falling off roofs um, and simple things like that. The, the, the issue always seems to be on the, uh, or, or the prominence um, in the debate is the issue of um, uh, major accidents such as uh, Chernobyl. Um, this was old technology by an old regime, um, badly administered and uh, it would never be repeated uh, like, like in, in a, any other country like it was in, in the Ukraine at the time. So I hope that answers your question. And uh, ANSTO, um, and ANSTO came up in, in the report. It's in New South Wales, it's a great facility. How can we make better use of uh, all the talent at ANSTO? Yeah, definitely. Um, it was the subject of some of the debate um, that was had during the state inquiry, particularly there was um, a bit of a discussion of, around the workforce needs. Um, the opponents of progressing nuclear power had said that we don't have the knowledge, we couldn't get the knowledge uh, or the workforce in Australia. And so it was, it was great to be able to take some of my parliamentary colleagues uh, to ANSTO to actually show them that there is a vast amount of work that goes on and that Australia through ANSTO is greatly respected on the world stage in the, nu the nuclear uh, industry. Um, in my opinion, it's, it's serves as, it, it could serve as somewhat of an incubator that could grow quite rapidly. Um, it really, in my opinion, wouldn't take much um, to start to leverage off the knowledge that is already there. Um, some of the evidence that I had seen chairing the inquiry was that we actually have 
a bit of brain drain um, with scientists, particularly nuclear scientists in Australia, needing to leave to be able to progress in their career. Um, so there's a diaspora of Australian scientists that would be ready to come back home. Um, on the earlier question around why it was banned at a federal level, it was actually quite a misnomer. Um, it wasn't the intention of the government. It was a small paragraph, a small amendment inserted in to the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Act um, by the Greens in the Senate. And the amendment was passed on the voices. There was no division. Um, it, there wasn't any kind of committee that looked into whether we should or shouldn't have that federal ban. It was simply inserted and, and waved on through um, in, the, uh, in the debate of, of that federal act at that point in time. So um, it sits there, it's legislated, uh, and it would take a great amount of effort to repeal. But, and that's, that's how it came about, the federal, the federal ban. Uh, another question for you, Taylor, is uh, what is the next step in removing the New South Wales prohibitions? Yeah, so we're fortunate that at the moment it's, it's, um, there is a private member's bill in front of us in the upper house, which is to repeal uh, the uranium mining and nuclear facilities um, prohibition bill, uh, prohibition act. Um, so it, it is in front of us for debate. Now, uh, it remains to be seen whether that will be amended in any form or whether something will change between now and when it's actually voted on. Um, but it is, it's still having it in front of us, debated in parliament, having it talked about in the media does progress the cause. Um, again, it's, it's the answer to what we hear on the TV and in, in the paper every day, which is the problem of emissions and the problem of secure, reliable base load power. Um, so, Every, every time it gets talked about publicly is a small win, but um, in terms of having it repealed, uh, that remains to be seen. Of course, we have a, a double ban. We have a ban in New South Wales and we have a ban at the Commonwealth level as well. Um, there's, there's different ways it could be done. There are those who want a quick and full-scale repeal, and of course there are those uh, such as the Greens who want to just hold the ban, and it must be said that it's part of at the Labor policy, at the Labor Party's federal policy platform, to have the ban on uh, on nuclear power and nuclear facilities, and so there would have to be quite a lot of uh, work done to to get to some position of bipartisanship, which it it has to be said would be somewhat needed to be able to then get to the end of this pathway, which is to have uh, a nuclear power facility. Um, now, there's been some ideas. Uh, that have been put out there, ideas that I put out, out there myself during this inquiry that we had, which would be to specifically uh, retain a ban on some of the older large scale facilities that people are so fearful, fearful of. Um, so your generation two facilities and whatnot. Uh, I don't think anybody, any commercial outfit would ever look at building anything of the sort again. And so I don't think politically it'd be any problem to retain a ban on older large scale facilities and have some sort of a carve out where newer walk away small scale reactors could be given the green light um, by such a mechanism as having um, you know, the chief scientists sign off that they're walk away safe. Um, that they're safe without the use of external power or external pumped water. Um, they're the kinds of uh, thresholds that would need to be met. Um, that's something that could all be flushed out in the future. Uh, one for you, Bob. Uh, would simply repealing the federal and state acts remove the impediments? If not, what other obstacles need to be overcome? The other obstacle that needs to be overcome is the uh, is the financing obstacle. Um, because nuclear power plants have, have large capital costs they have long lives, they have lives of say 80 years, um, but they're also quite capital intensive and therefore do require very substantial project financing. Um, that isn't easily done these days when 
um, everyone is scared about putting their money into long-term projects and not sure uh, that they'll get their money back. But uh, clearly, there does need to be community consultation about this. And if there's going to be favoured finance or favourable terms, um, uh, financial terms allowed, um, and they're supported by the government, there is a case for a, uh, uh, a transparent procedure, uh, which is not subject to sort of political dealings and backroom dealings, um, a procedure which examines um, exactly what impact uh, nuclear power with, with virtually zero emissions would have on the economy and what impact it would have on, uh, on supporting industry uh, that might otherwise have to close down. So th th there's, a, there's a great need for some careful management and nurturing of the, of the situation here. Um, I personally would like to see us get away from the, uh, this, the silly debate about whether or not it should be renewables or coal or whatever it should be. Um, we've got to be looking at our overall problem, the common problem, that is having a secure, uh, reliable power system uh, which moves towards zero emissions over the next uh, 50 years. So I think that um, it's, 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 we're, we're very close now to having solved, or at least overseas, they're very close to having solved the problem about how to build these plants on a more economic footing with the advent of the small modular reactors. Uh, we've heard a little bit about the New Scale Power Group um, during this uh, discussion today, and I believe that somebody from New Scale Power may actually be sitting in on this uh, webinar this evening, in which case that, that uh, uh, would be excellent. Uh, but I'd encourage anyone that's interested in this to go to the nuclear, uh, New Scale Power website and see for themselves um, just what New Scale have been doing. Um, Suzanne Jarawoski, who spoke to us earlier by video, she was preceded about five years earlier by uh, Ed McGuinness and uh, uh, one of his colleagues, uh, 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 Pete Lyons, uh, from the Department of Energy, who came out to talk to the Institute about uh, what they were doing in the US. And it's quite clear that uh, uh, the small modular reactor rep does represent a technical breakthrough. And I'm, I'm, I'm quite confident that you'll see a widespread of uh, developments take place, not just in developed countries like Australia, but in developing countries as well over the next uh, 20 years. Somebody earlier, I think, asked a question, uh, it may have been on the, uh, on the screen, about what would be the extent of the nuclear power developments in Australia. Well, um, if you put in one of the new scale power plants, um, the, they uh, are about um, 700 megawatts or, or, or so in size. Um, you could put one of those in every state of Australia and it would still only be uh, um, uh, four or 5,000 megawatts of power. So it would, it would not overtake the country, but it would be essential in providing that diversity and security of supply that Australia, I think, very much needs. We've got a question from um, one of the participants who's, who's very experienced that we know very well. And he says, um, what we are missing other than legality is a champion in the form of a utility or major organisation. How can this be addressed? Would you both like to try this one? I suspect Bob will have a fair bit to say on this, given his network and involvement. But if I could just say briefly, um, and I've said this before, it's almost a chicken or the egg argument. Um, I mean, at the moment, um, what we're talking about is banned. So no large entity with any sense of corporate governance is going to throw their limited resources uh, into even costing out uh, and coming up with a proposal uh, in Australia. So in my opinion, the ban needs to be at least partially lifted 
uh, and some kind of pathway to having a local vote on the location of a facility um, so that there's a bit of there's a better give and take here to allow for entities to actually undertake costings. Bob? So yes, the security of supply of um, our energy uh, and it, the affordability of our energy and the low emissions quality of our energy uh, is probably the single most important national challenge that the country is facing right now. Um, it's not been uh, the tradition in Australia that uh, uh, the private sector get together and and organise themselves in a group to act collectively. Um, there is, uh, I think, a little bit of latent interest in that, but I do think that the government does need to take the lead here. Um, the government can't expect the private sector to uh, uh, do its work for it. I think the government ought to be singling this out as an issue of national importance and and uh, addressing it. Now, to some extent, the, the government is laying the ground for this to take place with the current inquiry it's making into low emissions technologies and the preparation of a roadmap. Um, that's proving to be, even though the submissions haven't been in yet, um, that's proving to be uh, an enormous challenge. Um, we, we, we can't hope to wave a magic wand over all of our possible sources of, of, of uh, energy uh, uh, supply and, and, uh, and all the technologies that are involved. Um, it, it'll, it'll take years of work. So it's very important, I think, for those areas to be identified and singled out where collective effort where a nationally um, uh, led effort uh, would pay dividends. I spent a question from Queensland about ANSTO and what it does with schools. So they, they do a lot of work with, with schools and there's a lot of uh, school visits to ANSTO um, um, and they've got a lot of involvement. So there is, um, there is that education process is, is going on at the moment. Um, interesting question here for both of you, I think. To use a nuclear power generation capability, we need a place to dispose of the waste. No one wants a waste facility in their backyard. Do you think we need a disposal facility before we can start generating electricity? Well, could I, could I start the answer on that by saying um, we aren't so much talking about waste, we're just simply talking about spent fuel. Spent fuel is 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 easily uh, and safely stored. Um, it's just the the need to have long term uh, uh, stability in that storage process uh, requires that you uh, um, do deposit the the spent fuel in uh, in secure geological formations underground. Um, so those those sites are available. Uh, right around the country. Um, the Royal Commission in South Australia indicated that there were a number of sites uh, in South Australia that were suited as well as elsewhere in the country. Um, this is something that needs to be done. It, at the same time as it being an obligation, it's also a commercial opportunity. Um, I, I think that uh, I, I mentioned earlier about the need for some sort of government support or encouragement for uh, nationally important um, uh, uh, innovative uh, undertakings to be studied and and uh, and embarked upon, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be done by all governments simultaneously. Uh, as long as the the uh, legislative prohibition was removed at federal level, it would be quite within the the power of any any one of the states. Uh, to put its hand up to be the leader and be the pioneer and be the first in uh, with these with these new technologies and and developing uh, whatever the economic uh, 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 benefits were that would be likely to come from them. Um, so on that note, I might perhaps pass it over to 
tailor for any comment he might like to make? Yeah, it's a great question because it is one that comes up very frequently when the topics discussed, particularly in the public. Um, what do you do with the waste? Uh, you know, in popular media, it's purported to be, you know, almost like in The, in the Simpsons. You know, it's this lime green toxic waste you can't go near um, and that it's a huge problem. And Suzanne um, was trying to make the point in her video that at the moment, the technology is such that the problem is choosing an option as to what to do with the waste. Uh, and I agree that um, dry casking it and looking down the road as to, especially with um, reprocessing, um, that's one option. In Australia alone, in, in Kimber in South Australia, a local government area, they had a postal vote late last year and they voted, residents voted over 61% uh, to have a nuclear waste facility in Kimber in South Australia. So we have a site. We have a site chosen in Australia um, for that kind of medium to longer term um, holding of our waste. So things are in train on this front. And again, it comes back to get, injecting this debate with some facts. Um, you know, I think many people uh, who have tuned in will know how, how quickly the um, radioactivity falls off from the waste that comes from these facilities. Uh, and these are the sorts of facts that need to be injected into the debate. People think waste is sitting there glowing for tens of thousands of years. Um, it's just simply not true. And that's what, uh, you know, the, the people that don't want this, this side of the debate to progress, they want to say solar panels are the way to go and, and are totally ignorant to the envir environmental damage that mining all these rare earths does in mining and in disposal, like cadmium, one of the top six environmental issues that we don't know how to deal with. And cadmium is a major component in many um, solar panels. Uh, you know, so again, the facts need to be injected into this debate, and it's a great question, and there are answers. Again, it comes back to communication. There's a comment here that I want to share with you from uh, women in in nuclear. Australia is planning some public webinars in National Science Week uh, relating to nuclear. So we'd love everybody's help to spread the word. Info will be available by the WIND uh, Facebook page in a month or so, or contact WIND. So that's that's another good, really good initiative. It's good to see the women taking the lead, isn't it, Tony? <laughs> it is because uh, traditionally, I think women have been more against nuclear than, than men. Uh, just one, I think, final question for you, for you both. How has the new market landscape impacted on the economics of nuclear? Will nuclear power need market reform, such as a guaranteed takeoff price, to be viable? Well, my answer to that is it's it's affected all, all uh, enterprises and all financing challenges uh, um, uh, pretty much equally. Uh, there is going to be um, a much greater scrutiny applied to requests uh, for financing large-scale projects. I mean, for example, if COVID had uh, been here a year or so ago, um, it may well be that the Commonwealth Government may not have had the, uh, the desire or such desire to fund uh, Snowy 2.0. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, ways governments can spend your money um, and they're not going to have as much money in the future as they've had in, in, in the past. And most of their um, spare cash has been committed for the next five to ten years, I think, Tony, uh, uh, addressing the economic challenges thrown up by the COVID crisis. So we've just got to get smarter with what we do. But if these coal-fired power stations have a limited life around Australia, they've got to be replaced with something and they've got to be replaced with weathered, with with technologies that are not weather dependent. And so we've got to look afresh at all these things, but we've got to focus very much, I think, on the technologies. If you use old technologies, um, uh, you, you're only going to um, 
put, stave off the inevitable uh, when you're going to have to reform the industry totally. I think that uh, the, the, the current federal government's inquiry into uh, uh, low emissions technology uh, should be supported, but at the same time, uh, it should only be supported on the basis that all technology is uh, treated on, a, on an equal footing and we have a technology neutral approach, not a pretend technology neutral when it, when it sounds good. Uh, but I do think that that process does need to be accelerated. And I agree with Bob. Um, we need to be truly technology agnostic and many the politicians, federal and state, past and present, have said we're technology agnostic, but when you have two bands on a baseload power uh, producer with no emissions, you can't call yourself technology agnostic. So that's something that needs to be overcome. We need policy certainty in the energy area. That's been a problem of Australian politics for over a decade now. Um, and as Bob said, um, we need to stop picking winners and we need to, and, I, and the federal government has moved towards um, having removed subsidies for particular technologies and I, I think that's quite ideal. So just to add one more point, um, this has got an important economic development uh, benefit associated with this uh, if we were to establish uh, a new industry in, in nuclear power. Um, uh, Tony, I think you got this information recently from the uh, the, uh, the state of Idaho in the US, um, where the Department of Labor has forecast that the first SMR, which is expected to commence construction in another year or so, um, is likely to generate uh, a large number of jobs during construction. Um, the figure they quoted actually was 12,800 jobs during the construction of one of these plants. Um, which um, that seems to be an extraordinary uh, number of jobs and has really important economic development implications, I think, for the way we go about exploring what our desired future is in New South Wales. Yes, there's, there's the direct construction jobs, so there's a thousand or so of those, and then the ongoing <coughs> operational jobs, so there's about 300 on one of those SMRs. But it's it's all the associated jobs, um, all the supplies, and all all the, all the things that we can do in, in Australia, uh, and this brings very big uh, economic advantages. Well, I'm afraid we've run out of time. We've got lots more questions, but um, we've just run out of time now. So. Thanks very much to Susan Jarowski for allowing us to show her presentation. Uh, thank you very much to Robert Pritchard and the Honourable Taylor Martin for spending time tonight with us. Thanks, uh, thank, thank you to uh, Engineers Australia National and Sydney Division, and particularly to Joanne Rowley, who's helped in organising this, uh, this event. And thank you to all who registered and participated in this event. Lots of interesting questions and thanks for your support. Um, there was one question on hydrogen and interestingly, the next nuclear engineering panel event will be on the 15th of July when we'll be looking at nuclear power and, and the hydrogen economy. And one more event uh, tomorrow that you may be interested in and I expect a lot of people are already registered for in. Uh, Energy Policy Institute of Australia webinar, 4 p.m. tomorrow night on the technology roadmap, which is uh, an important, really important development. So thank you all for participating and attending. Um, we'll see you next time. Thank you.